it's gone to the very extreme, right? Remember Daytona, we're going, <laughs> we were going so slow. <laughs> it, was like, it, was, it was like a bicycle race is what I thought. Like, was like how I was moving and a couple of people like jumped out to try to get the field yeah. going back. It was like, what are we doing? Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 14 of Mics Are Hot on Racing America. If you're watching this on video, I'm Alanis King. This is my cat, Portia, and that is Monica Palumbo. Hey, everybody. I love Portia just knew when it, exactly when to walk by. It was perfect timing. She, you know, she knows exactly when to walk by all the time, and now she's rubbing her face on my ring light. Now she is rubbing her face on my phone because I'm about to show you what she was doing before we started. If you're watching this on video, obviously you can see Portia under my computer stand, but if you're not watching this on video, I have a little computer stand that holds my laptop up, and Portia lays under it it and stares at me the whole time we're recording unless she's right here on camera show him your face honey there she is <laughs> she made it i love it monica loves it monica gets so excited every time portia walks by I do. she's just like there she is and then she walks by for guests and guests are like who is the out oh, and I heard <laughs> Great. She was saying, what's up, girl? She said, hey, everybody. <laughs> this is what she does. She's very uh, disturbing, distracting. She gets on all of my podcasts. I absolutely love her. But today, in addition to Portia, we have another guest on the show, and that is Joey Logano, because our theme is unpredictable races like Talladega Super Speedway. And I heard that somebody named Joey is decent at driving at Talladega Super Speedway. I mean, with three wins there, <laughs> he's such a great Super Speedway racer in general. So it's it's going to be really cool to have him on, get his perspective. You know, he's been in the sport. I guess you can consider him a veteran at this oh. point, right? So he's going to give us some good insight. Isn't the concept of time so upsetting? I mean, at one point, at one point in life, Joey Logano was the new kid, sliced bread. Yeah, and now it's like, no, he's he's old like us. <laughs> yeah, right. Time is moving way too fast. Yeah, he was one of the youngest winners. He made all these records growing up, right? Yeah, he's got a great resume. He's he's made a name for himself. Two time champion. Mm -hmm. He's won at many tracks. So excited. My he's hanging out with us. Portia is just scooting my microphone to the side so she can lay next to me. And I'm like, hun, I can't just lean toward Mama, the microphone. Mama is working. <laughs> Mama is working. Mama has things to do. But let's talk about Talladega. It is a super speedway. And what makes a track a super speedway? Well, it used to be that a super speedway was a big track. If it was bigger than like a mile, you got a big old track on your hands. That's a super speedway. But there was the introduction of the intermediate oval in NASCAR's history, which is like the mile and a half track, the that range. So mm -hmm. a super speedway kind of became an oval race that's two miles or longer, right? Our typical yeah. super speedway races are Daytona International Speedway and Talladega Super Speedway. And for a long time, they were called plate races, which meant they used restrictor plates. plates. Yes, what restrictor plates do is they actually choke the airflow to the engine to bring down the engine's horsepower. And what NASCAR would do would you would show up to the track to race. NASCAR would give you the restrictor plate, the mandated restrictor plate with the mandated opening, so you couldn't make the opening bigger and get more air to your engine, thus more horsepower. And they would say, here, this is yours. Don't mess with it. And then you would go out there with less horsepower so you weren't going as fast. So it was less dangerous, right? Because these yeah. are very fast tracks. Now with the introduction of new car packages and things like that, plate races aren't really a technical term anymore because we use restrictor plates at other places. Mm -hmm. But it's still kind of called a plate race, but you call it a super speedway to be completely correct. Yeah, I love that you know everything under the hood. So for all of our... <laughs> Listeners and people watching, can you tell Alana <laughs> is a car junkie and knows her stuff? I love that you know all the technicalities of oh, that. Oh, 
Thank you. Well, it's kind of like, so, you know, when you're out on the road, if you see a more powerful car, uh, cars have big grills in general, but those grills aren't fully used, right? Yeah. So you can actually Google pictures of cars without their fake grills on them. And the grills are actually very small, the actual grills on a oh, car. Oh, really? Um, yeah, no, the grills on cars are actually very small. And the grills you see on the road are just for design, right? Mm -hmm. So... The, the opening is a lot smaller. So basically you want airflow to your engine and to your car. And the more airflow you have, the more horsepower you can get. So that restrictor plate chokes the airflow and brings down the horsepower. Look at, I mean, I just, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now I'm even learning more stuff too. That, 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 that's great. I mean, I can tell you why a super speedway is unpredictable, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Because it is such a long track and there's so much room for error mm -hmm. and there's always the big one. You never know whether it's best to start up front or start in the back or when to make your move. That's why it's unpredictable. We've seen some of the biggest wrecks at these super speedways too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also at super speedways, you're driving in a pack. So yeah. Often. Now, sometimes we have an, a weird package here and there where they actually drive in a drafting line instead of a pack. But a lot of the times you're drafting in a pack that's either two wide or three wide car wise. Mm -hmm. So if you're three wide, 10 rows deep and you do something wrong, you're taking a majority of those 10 rows with you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, anything can happen for sure. Mm -hmm. So... I bet you can answer this one too then. Oh, gosh. So what makes Talladega Super Speedway such a unique NASCAR racetrack? Well, you know, it's the longest oval on the calendar at 2.66 miles. There, of course, we have road courses that are longer. Yeah. But when you have those high speeds and the high banking and you have those large, large drafts, you get the wild wrecks. So when you talk to somebody about NASCAR and they don't know a lot about NASCAR, something like Daytona or Talladega is what's going to come to mind because that's what you see on the highlight reels. That's what you mm -hmm. see everywhere, right? That's what you see in pop culture. You have Talladega nights. Talladega is a very interesting place. I also think there's some like weird history with Talladega. It's built near a burial ground or something like that. Am I right on that, Monica? I think so. I mean, it is in the middle of nowhere, right? I, I don't, I don't mean that mean, but I'm saying <laughs> there's I, some superstition fly, around it. Yeah, I fly into Atlanta and then I drive into Talladega, and it's this this long road, and it's a beautiful drive. But once you come up and the track is on your left hand side, for me, it's like ah, Talladega, and it's got the flags, and there's um huge campsites everywhere as you're coming in and you can actually smell people burning their wood. Like it's <laughs> like, I'm pulling, I'm pulling into Talladega. Here we go. You can feel the energy. They have a huge, um, stage in the campsite for bands to play all night long. And mm -hmm. then, and then to the left, this is my visual coming in from the highway is Talladega mm -hmm. and the whole experience with Talladega Boulevard and the infield. And I know I talk about this all the time is, is amazing. The garage is open. You can see what's happening in the garage. They've got big bills, which is this huge covered bar with big TVs, um, concession stands in there. You can watch the race right outside a big bill. Um, they even have like a playground in the infield for people, you know, when you bring your kids, they can literally play on the playground. You're watching the race, enjoying yourself. It's just insanely thought out. Oh, wow. Honestly, yeah. I got on a swing the other day <laughs> and it was great. It was great. My one complaint about the swings are that they're built for children and... <laughs> Therefore, they're not as high off the ground. <laughs> no, no, it didn't okay, break. You were going there. I was like, no, no, but they're not as high off the ground as they would be oh, for an yeah. adult. Yeah. So when you swing forward, you know, when your legs come forward, you actually have to like, you have to kick your feet lean out. Back. Yeah. Yes. And lean back. So you're less tall because if not, your feet will just hit the ground. And I'm like, we need some adult swings. Like right? I make them a little higher. Make them a little higher. The kids can deal. I need now, to be on the swing. That might be dangerous at Talladega, though. Because <laughs> those people like to party. So could you imagine all these adults on the adult swing? 
<laughs> oh, no. it would be, it would be no. awesome though. no because they would be like they would be partying and then they would be like <laughs> When I was five years old, I used to jump off the swing when I was me, really high. And they would just try it again, catapult and just boom. <laughs> oh my God. It, that would be bad. That would yeah. be bad. Talladega yeah. do not have higher swing sets. That's so funny. <laughs> Leave but them you, child size. Maybe somebody who's listening will bring one to Talladega Boulevard. So, you know, we're talking about the infield fan experience. But also in the infield, because clearly it's a super speedway, so there's tons of room inside. There's Talladega Boulevard, which is historic, I think. Mm -hmm. When you think of Talladega, you also think Talladega Boulevard. I have experienced Talladega Boulevard in my younger years, and there are some stories that okay. I cannot okay. share. I was about to say, I'll let's go. never forget. <laughs> I was like, what are they, Monica? Let's go. I mean, it's it's a sight to see. Uh, maybe not family friendly. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not but family. So much fun. I mean, these people are there truly to have a great time. They enjoy NASCAR. Everybody's bonding and I don't know it's just it's just a good time it's a whole road there's actually two roads but there's mainly Talladega Boulevard mm -hmm. um, and these people have these campsites for years and they put their own homemade bars up and stages and they bring in their own bands and it's like a party you've never seen before at the racetrack. They're offering you food come over here we got barbecue hot dogs hamburgers. yes it's this amazing I was at the 24 Hours of Le Mans last year with the Garage 56 NASCAR car and everything That's like that. That's probably a little bit fancier than Talladega Boulevard. Well, 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 deba no. <laughs> debatable. Um, <laughs> we are in the French countryside here. We're out in the country. Um, but it was like 4 o'clock in the morning. And everybody was asleep because you're you're sleeping, right? We got we to gotta be up for the end. Because Le Mans, my complaint about Le Mans, is that locally it starts in like the afternoon. And you don't start a 24 hour race in the afternoon because oh when, my. when the next morning comes, you got like a million hours to go, you know, right. you got to start it. You got to start it early so that once you pass the midnight mark, there are fewer hours to go. Anyway, it was like 4 a.m. Everybody was asleep except for this one campsite was just like. They had all of these lights, like rainbow lights. They were doing karaoke. We walk up and they just like start pouring us like some bizarre mixture of alcohol. And I was like, oh, you know boy. what? I'm here. I'm going to do it. Ah! And then I was like, um, whatever. I'm here. Um, we start doing karaoke. And one of the men is in his underwear, no oh, shoes, boy. no nothing. He's just in his underwear doing karaoke so i sang country roads by john denver with the underwear man with him? and then he was like <laughs> ah. he was like ah i need to put some clothes on so he put on a bear onesie perfect a bear onesie it was and the best thing the best part about all of this is that i was there doing a, t a story for top gear yes top oh, gear magazine yeah. which is related to the top gear tv show which was once hosted by jeremy clarkson and all of them and top gear magazine was there with me we took photos from karaoke so if you look at this issue of top gear magazine bear onesie guy is in his bear onesie and he's also in his underwear in top That's gear awesome. and and we told him hey buddy you're gonna be in top gear on the shelves in your underwear and he was like yeah he's cool. living his best life you know he's probably like i'm gonna sign autographs after this <laughs> all the he ladies he's in his underwear <laughs> Let's go. Just, yeah. He was great. thrilled. He was thrilled. And that was my French Talladega moment. <laughs> That's a, and you'll never forget it. I will never forget it for the rest of my life. That, that memory <laughs> will go on forever and ever while the garage 56 car was out there. So if you're not familiar with garage 56, basically NASCAR did an experimental car to Lamar. Garage 56 is the innovative mm -hmm. class, which means you don't have to follow the rules of Lamar. You can just show up. So NASCAR brought a like really, really beefy NASCAR car. And all these cars are going by because it's it's sports car racing. It's endurance racing, right? So it's like, and then there was one other V8 out there that was loud that was like, yeah. 
Oh, here comes like the garage that's music NASCAR. Car. Yeah. <laughs> and because not only was this engine super loud, but compared to those cars, those cars have rear exit exhausts. So the exhaust noise is going out the back of the car. NASCAR has side exit exhaust. So the exhaust sound goes into the stands. It goes to either side of the track. So it was so much louder than every other vehicle. That every time what it went by, the fans' reactions out there were like, "Whoa, okay, America, Monica, America, you're Monica. always so loud." <laughs> Here's the thing: so before Garage Fifty Six happened, I think everyone who worked on it would agree, and I actually talked about this in an upcoming documentary about it. I think everyone would agree there wasn't this massive cultural shift to watch the Garage Fifty Six car. Right? It was just another thing that was happening in racing, and then the big thing that happened was. Lama does a class photo on the grid every year. So you have all the cars get on on the grid and they were like, I think three wide on the grid, right? So it's all these tiny little sports cars and prototypes. And then in the middle of the photo, everybody listening, watching, Google it, there is a massive vehicle. It's like a bunch of Miatas and then a Suburban. <laughs> and the Suburban is the Garage 56 car. And That's everybody funny. online was like, is this photoshopped? There's no way this is real. This car is twice the size of every other car out there. And it literally was because I talked to Jimmy Johnson, who was one of the drivers for the car. Yeah. I talked to him at nine o'clock in the morning on Sunday. And I said, tell me what it's like to drive the car. Like put me in there. And he said, when you're passing someone or someone is passing you, you have to straighten your back up and look down over your shoulder because it's like, it's basically like you're an 18 wheeler truck driver right. compared to normal cars. He said, you have to straighten your back out, look down over your shoulder. And that's how you see where the car is because they don't have spotters. Cause it's like an eight and a half mile track. Oh, gotcha. Ridiculous, ridiculous. The car was that big and that loud. So you asked what it was like. Everybody freaked out once it got there and Garage 56 became this cultural movement because it was like, America, right? free bird, let's go. Everything is bigger and louder. <laughs> and goofier. Like You're it clearly was clearly American, but you know, clearly. kudos to NASCAR. It was amazing. Um, One of the best things I've ever Hendrick seen. for coming together to do that. I mean. Mm -hmm. You're so right. And every four minutes when that car went by, so at Le Mans, you try to sleep, right? But that car was so loud that everyone would doze off. They would go, mm. the car would go, Row! and they would wake up. They go, there it is. And then they'd go back to sleep. And every single time, I'm not kidding, it was a 24 hour race. Every single time that car went by, you had to say something. There was no time in which you didn't say something. So it was either like, there it is again. Hell yeah. <laughs> NASCAR. You miss it. Yeah. And it's like, and you know, Monica, you know, like in America saying NASCARs or the NASCAR oh yeah. is kind of like, it's kind of looked down upon because NASCAR yeah. is an acronym, right? It's a NASCAR car. It's the NAS, it's NASCAR racing series. Like there are different series, but because this is France and it was a cultural movement, all of the French people and all of the other people are like the NASCAR, the NASCAR, the NASCAR. The NASCAR. So within a couple of hours, you're just calling it the NASCAR because that's just what the cultural movement is doing right now. <laughs> did so you say it with time. an accent? Like I, 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 I did an accent, but I, I did it because I can't do I can't do it. No, that was a pretty good one, Monica. <laughs> I cannot do an accent to save my life, but I did start calling it the NASCAR. I'm not it sounds gonna lie. fancier, the NASCAR. I have that. <clears throat> race on my list at some point, but I just can't seem to get away from the NASCAR. It's it's you know? Monica. Like you can't get away from the NASCAR. You're just here. I, can. I, I you're love the NASCAR. NASCAR. I love you're, NASCAR. You're watching the NASCARs. Um you should go. It's really, really, really cool. Yeah. Someday. That's super Someday. cool. Yeah. It's it was quite an experience, but that was that was my Talladega moment and it happened yeah. in France. Okay, well then we'll have to get you a real Talladega moment for sure oh um, yeah yeah monica let's go let's make some memories on. we can't discuss on the podcast uh, come on you even <laughs> see drivers go. out there they enjoy themselves i'm not gonna name any names not, they make not disgusting. out there and <clears throat> prob probably not on a saturday night but definitely on a thursday or friday on a thursday they're down there <laughs> yeah it's, oh. it's so much fun but we've got a great show i'm so um, excited <laughs> Joey Logano is going to be joining us here on Mics Are Hot to talk more about Talladega and life on the road with family. So I'm excited to catch up with him.
I am. But before we catch up to him, I think we should like catch up with each other. How is your oh, life yeah. going right now, Monica? Life is good. You know, I got a a baby on the way and so I'm in the home stretch here. Mm -hmm. I've got, I don't know, maybe seven or eight weeks left. We'll see when he wants to make his appearance, but I'm trying to work as far as I can up until that point. So oh, yeah, my I'm, goodness. Heading, I'm heading to Talladega. Um, and I'm just, I'm so excited to go there. And then from there I'll be in Dover, Kansas, Darlington, and we'll see if I can make it to North Wilkesboro we'll and Charlotte. We'll Charlotte, I'm literally due it. like 10 days later. So we'll, and it's the longest Ooh. race of the year with the Coca-Cola 600. <laughs> so, um, we'll you should, see. you should start just taking a camping chair with you and just like, <laughs> just like pop down in the camping chair. That's like hysterical. Well, they have, I think they actually make like little things you can attach to your legs that just become a seat. You should just really? walk around. Yeah, you should Google so I'm it. I'm on the grid doing interviews with drivers and then just, and you just, I just sit. pop down when I need to and then yep. get back up and then yep. you yeah, just sit. that'd be great. You know? I think this is I think this is fantastic. Well, my week has been um ridiculous. I had to get here to talk to Joey in a couple of minutes, and my flight would not leave where I was at. I was in California and we get on the plane, we board. And fully boarded, they say the plane is fully boarded, but we have discovered a hole in the plane because the plane got struck by lightning. And we were like, what? And they were like, get off. This plane Did is not going anywhere. Did you ever see this hole? Did you ever was no, it like it was apparently, or? they said it was on the wing. Um, so I never saw it. They said the hole was on the wing and they said, get off. The plane's not going anywhere. But the airline wouldn't cancel the flight because they were like, it'll go eventually. Sure. Yeah. So the system would not rebook you. But they were like, you need to get rebooked. But then when you call American, they're like, no, you know, the flight's going, you're fine. And I was like, no, it's not. So I started having to go to the gates, the desks, and uh -huh. just trying to get on flights that went kind of toward Texas to get home. And then trying to get on more flights that went toward Texas to get like, home. Like, okay, so if I can get here, I'm a little bit closer. And then if here. And then here. Here. But also I can't fly at this time on this day because I have to talk to Monica and Joey Locano. Like so you can't be midair doing your, I can't, I can't doing be midair. But I have to just like inch toward home. But they never unloaded our bags from the lightning plane. So my bag is still I on the lightning it. plane. It's, it's literally on the plane. Life on the road, so glamorous. It's great, right? It's great. And I'm texting Monica and, and our producer Krista, and they're like, Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. this I'm is like, how I it is. get it. I, it's, yep. This is, yep. I've been there, done that. Yep. <clears throat> it won't be mm -hmm. your first and it won't be your last. It happens every single time. I think I've seen it all. Something new happens. Yeah. I was like a hole in the plane due to lightning. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. All of my stuff is in California. Okay. But my time in California was lovely. But speaking of travel, that is why I never check a bag because yes, I just force, I force feed my carry on. You're so I mean, right. I squeeze everything in that thing just for these incidences where I can just grab it and go or whatever I need to do. Cause it's, it's unpredictable. Just like these tracks when you, Oh, that was good. That was good. <laughs> hey, unpredictable races theme. <laughs> um, no, the thing is sometimes like when you're standby. So I was standby for these flights inching toward Texas. So that means you're last to get on, which means that the yes. flight is full. You have to check your carry on, but I did bring a check bag. So I brought a carry on and a check bag. Yeah. And my specific reasoning was, um, in San Diego, California, there's this store called the black and they have an unreal selection of dragon figurines mm -hmm. and so i brought an empty bag to bring home dragon figurines so i had to check a bag i see i uh, see that makes sense i had to add to my little dragon yeah. family but oh, yeah then, then but it's worth it that means my checked bag is still on the plane in san diego <laughs> oh well, you'll get it in a few weeks don't worry <laughs> about that be here eventually hope nothing yeah. important was in there literally my camera for this podcast was in that bag so hello from my my computer's camera <laughs> it works you know first world problems it works and we can see you and and it's all good amir, amir you can see the exhaustion in my eyes isn't it lovely <laughs> oh my goodness what a time well, but we're I'm glad so you're here i'm glad i'm here you made it home oh my god i'm glad i'm here i'm glad we're talking to joey logano today it's going to be so much fun.
Well, we are so excited to welcome two-time champion, driver of the number 22, Team Penske Ford, Joey Logano. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How's it going, Joey? How's your day? My day's going pretty well so far. Uh, things are things are going good. Kids are happy. Race cars are ready. What what else can you ask for? I mean, sounds like a dream to me. So I've got to ask you. Just mention your kids. You have three children. I have my third on the way. How big of a difference is it going from two to three kids? Is it just because my house is already complete chaos with two boys. I'm gonna have another boy. We got three boys. Oh yeah. no. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I want to make you feel better about this. But, uh, I, you know, I think it depends on, I think it depends on the kids. So like my oldest Hudson, he's not too needy. He's pretty easy. My middle child, Jameson, he's a maniac and you can't take your eyes off him for a second. Because he's just going to jump off the ledge or do something stupid. Right. So you gotta like, someone's gotta keep an eye on him. And then the baby, Abelia, She's already smarter than Jameson, so I, I could almost trust Amelia more than I can Jameson right now. So I'm, oh, I feel like we're coming out of the hole, okay? Yeah, Cause yeah. Like the first two years of baby number three was like, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> Chaos. Right? Like this was, this might have been the wrong thing. <laughs> and, and now it, we're coming out of the hole and it's becoming a lot of fun because now they all kind of hang out with each other and they're getting older and they're not fighting as much. Right. And so we're, we're getting better. We're okay, getting better. Okay, just wait, because mine are, so I'm, I have a big jump. I have a nine and seven year old boy, and then I'm going from boys and then going to a newborn. Mm -hmm. But you just wait till your boys <laughs> get older. Uh -huh. They they like to argue about, they can have the same exact basketball and they're still going to fight over that one <laughs> basketball that they want. Yeah. Okay. I have a question for both parents because I'm not a parent. Do children still play in creeks? Is that a thing? For us, yes. We okay. make them go outside. Okay, so they yeah. still play in creeks and stuff. It, well, we don't have a creek in our yard, but but <laughs> there's a lot of mud and they're in the mud constantly. Okay, yeah. good. Because I was like a creek kid and I don't know. I don't yeah. I just didn't know if children were know. in the creeks anymore. <laughs> yeah, we force ours outside to fish and ride their go karts and Get out, get yeah. outside of the house. Okay, that's I love this. To keep them away from a screen. Yes. <laughs> that's what yeah, I was but, wondering. I was like, what's the screen time versus the creek time? Yeah. I don't really know. Cause like <laughs> my, my kids will be delayed in technology. I promise you, they have no idea. They don't even know what they're missing yet, which is good. I, love I think that's good. They have no idea what's even available. <laughs> no, I think that's good. It's you regret having technology as a child as you get older. You're like, oh, mm. I wish I wish I wouldn't have been on Twitter when I was in middle school. Like, <laughs> You're making me feel old, Alanis. <laughs> I know. I'm so sorry. Monica, do you remember Twitter in middle school? Or what? I, um, I, I was working in NASCAR when Twitter came out. Um, <laughs> Oh my god, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, we can... I we never did. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, we can forget about that little aside. Um, speaking of children, Joey, I think you started racing at like six years old in Connecticut, but you did not come from a racing family. So one, whose idea was it to get you into racing? And two, what were you like as a kid? I want to know what little mm. Joey was like. Well, um, so I got a go-kart for Christmas and I was maybe, I don't know, five or so. And that was, I loved it. And I was a car kid before that, right? I loved Hot Wheels cars. My dad had a couple of classic cars and I loved just being around those things. Um, my father had a, a garbage trucking company in Connecticut. And so I was constantly around, I was in the garage all the time, right? Was like, I was the kid that was always, you know, cool trucks, go-karts, I'd drive things around there. I had, I had a lot of fun doing that stuff. And my dad, like, was into cars, but he wasn't a, a racer by no means. He's never raced in his life. Like, and he was so committed into his business um, and, and ran a hell of a business. But that that was just kind of what we did. Like, every day I'd get home from school and I'd drive the go-kart. And I tried other sports. My my father played baseball and basketball through high school. And um, so he naturally gave me a – you know, sticking a ball and I sucked at it. I, I hated it. <laughs> so did I. I. I was like, I was like, you know, it's not really my thing. And, and I got in a go-kart and just had fun. And he realized that. And, uh, one of his, his employees I worked for him, uh, his son raced quarter midgets at Silver City Quarter Midget Club, Meriden, Connecticut. And 
uh, we went and watched a couple times and it was a pretty big commitment to do, right? To take, to go racing with your kids is really a big commitment, um, a time commitment and a financial commitment. And so we waited a year and then we bought a used car and uh, started racing a little bit on the weekends and we didn't know what the heck we were doing. That was the best part about it. And honestly, <laughs> probably the most fun I ever had racing is the first like five to 10 years of my career because it was just, we didn't know what we were doing. There was no pressure. There was no expectations to be somebody in it. We are just, I don't know, I like driving. Let's go drive, dad. Like that's what I yeah. wanted to do. And so we did that and it was a blast. And so, um, yeah, little Joey was just wanting to be around cars all the time. And, and honestly, old Joey is the same. <laughs> I love <laughs> that. That's but so sweet. The, the coolest thing. So, um, my, my parents kept that, that quarter midget, right. And it was, uh, and just parked it. I don't know why they kept it. Just never sold it. And fast forward up to two years ago, which is, I don't know, almost 30 years later, uh, I took my my son Hudson, put, got the same car, put an engine in that car and brought it up to Silver City. And he drove laps on that track. And we retook a picture as identical to the one me and my dad had Aww. when I was a kid. And then it's kind of fast forward into the three of us doing it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and that was a throwback car in Darlington. When we won in Darlington a couple years back, uh, the throwback car was to that quarter midget. So it was pretty cool. Okay, I'm going to say, that? I'm really tired from my travel day. And I started crying a little because my eyes were already <laughs> wet. And I thought it was really sweet that you retook that picture. And I started crying a little. So that ignore me. Cry? That, that's no. all it takes. Okay, Joey, I'm, very, I'm a very emotional person. It's and that was just, um, very sweet. We got plenty more. <laughs> and it's my lack of sleep, too. <laughs> it's totally lack of sleep. Um, you said there was like that, those years of when you were just out there racing, having a great time with your dad. But at what age do you think you and your dad looked at each other and thought, I can make this a career? Like, when did it? At one point in your life, did it hit you and you thought, okay, this is, I, I can make this a forever job? Yeah, I think at some point it changed from a dream to a reality, right? Because the dream, like when you're a kid, think about it, when you're six, seven years old, you want to be an astronaut, you want to be a doctor, you want to be whatever, but, but it's, it's a dream, right? And, and I want to be a race car driver. That was the dream, right? And, and, and I was doing what I was having fun doing, but the chances of making it, like, you don't know. But as a kid, you think is, yeah, I'm going to do it. You know? <laughs> yeah. You're going to make it. Right. And uh, I guess when I was probably, I guess when I, when I turned maybe 12 or 13 is when I kind of realized this, this is getting a little bit more serious than just going to have fun. Right. Like it, this was to win and it was to make a career out of. And um, I was fortunate enough to, to keep, you know, kind of moving up through the ranks really quickly and, um, and winning in front of the right people and getting those right opportunities. And eventually it kind of all worked out. Um, but I'd say somewhere around there is when it, when it switched over. Oh yeah. And you were talking about Hudson and I want to ask how much interest are you seeing in your kids in terms of them driving themselves, if at all? And how do you approach that as someone who drives professionally? How do you keep that balance of helping your kid, but also not forcing them to drive? Yeah, well, that's that's the that's the key is to show them. I think other options. Mm -hmm. uh, we're so exposed to cars and NASCAR and all that, and of course, I want to share that that passion with them, but I don't want to force it on them to want to, you know, or to to feel like they need to go race or they need. I want them to see other things. So um, Hudson's my oldest, so it, it's probably the easiest with him to kind of explain but right now, like. We got him in basketball. We got him in baseball. He's raced a few times. And honestly, he loves basketball the most right now. Okay. And he he wants to drive every minute he's with dad. Yeah. Right? When, when dad's there, when dad gets home, it's crazy carts, four wheeler, you know, constantly. Let's go, let's go. RC cars. I want to drive. I want to drive. And that's <laughs> an image of me. He's 100%. But I think when he shows up to the racetrack, like the couple times we did race, it, it, it kind of sucks because he shows up as Joey Logano's son. Yeah. Not, like, I showed up to the racetrack as Joey Logano, Logano. like Tom Logano's kid who has a garbage company. Like nobody, <laughs> like, nobody knows. Right. And like when he shows up, he's expected because it's two time champ Joey's right. kid. And 
he's supposed to be going out there and winning when he, he's no, like he <laughs> hasn't done anything in his life yet. Right. Like he's a kid. Yeah. And so I try to, like, when we go to the track, I try to make it as, as calm and like low key as possible. Like we show up in the back of a pickup truck. He has a dirty old suit. He has a scratched up helmet that he wears on his four wheeler. That's the same one he wears in his go kart when he goes racing. Like I need to get somebody to help me unload this go kart because I don't have ramps or anything like that. Like this, <laughs> we got a tool bag and an air compressor to blow up the tire. That's all we're taking. That's it. And and if we're gonna go racing, that's that's all we're gonna do because I don't want him to. It's already weird for him mm-hmm. that he shows up to the racetrack and race fans know his name. That's already weird. Right. Like it's not normal in any way. So I don't want him to think he's something he's not. He ain't done nothing. Yeah. Right. Like he ain't eating crap. So like we gotta, <laughs> he's gotta earn it. You know what I mean? And so I, that's kind of the, the approach we have taken with Hudson so far. And, and, you know, it's, it's been going okay, but they all seem to like cars so far. Amelia might be the, the biggest car junkie of them all. <laughs> that's you know, from, really like, exciting. I, I actually. Gotta, my my Ford, I got a Ford Raptor, and every time she gets here, I get in the truck, and yeah, I get in the truck, and she goes, I do donuts. That's what she do donuts. So before we leave the house, it's, uh, I, have, I have a problem, right? So I got like a skid pad behind my shop. Right? So, I love it. And so we do a donut and we leave, and she loves it. So oh, whatever. I love it's that. Really so no, I don't like doing donuts at all. It's for no. the kids. No, 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 no. Of course. I actually had a follow up because I thought your answer was really, really thoughtful about having kids and going to the track. Now you talk about going to the track and what it's like there, but you as a very successful parent, how do you, how do you interact with your kids in terms of their future? Because obviously they're going to feel like they have a lot to live up to. How do you tell them like, Hey, you can do whatever you want in life. I just tell them that. Okay. Uh, so it works. Know. I, I don't know if it works yet. Okay. I, I, so you're talking, I, I, my oldest is six. I am a rookie so, parent. Okay. So I don't, Monica knows way more about parenting than I do. I, I promise say the you. same thing. I just say whatever you want. If you want to play basketball, if you want to do theater, if you, you know, they have, they got a go-kart yeah. from Santa. I kinda... Whatever you do, try to be the best in the world at it. That's all I tell them. Oh. I just want to see him try. I, I don't care if he's actually good or not, but I want to see some hustle. That's yeah. all I care. I want to see them work at it because that's what it's about. Kids in sports, like like we talked about, the chances of making it is is slim, but the lessons they learned will carry forever. And that's what it's about to me. Like when, when we go play basketball, I just want them in there hustling. Just go grab yeah. the ball from these kids. Like that's what I'm like. Go get them. Like, yeah. you know, like run Isn't as fast it? as you can. Like that's it's all so I, that's cool. I care about. Yeah, yeah, as a parent, like seeing your child passionate about something like that, like with basketball or whatever it is, um, and you see them out there and they're truly enjoying it, you know, that's what makes it really special. But I got to mention this too, because on your Instagram, this cracks me up, Joy. Whenever <laughs> you post stories of Hudson um, in your backyard on the, the go kart track, and he's uh-huh. just hauling tail <laughs> back there. It oh, is yeah. awesome. I love watching that. <laughs> we did a, uh, is a funny story. I don't know if this is all supposed to be about kids or not, but we're having fun talking it's about fun. kids. We're having fun. <laughs> so, his school has a talent show. It came up, right? And I'm like, well, Hudson, what do you want to do for, like, do you want to be part of the talent show? Yeah, I want to do the talent show. What do you want to do? Well, you can send in a video. And he's like, all right. And so he likes watching the Jim Connor series, you know, that Ken Block oh, did. Yeah. You know, and so, so we built one together, me and him. We did it called Kid Connor. Okay, You're kidding. Yeah. No it way. Is awesome. <laughs> so we got him on his four wheeler and he's sliding, he's jumping in, he's he's doing he's being a goof. And we're trying to we try to edit it, you know, me and him, which we are not <laughs> I love this so much. But it came out awesome. I, I have to I gotta have to post it. No, um, please. Yeah. I really I, I really want to see it. it. Hilarious. And um yeah, so that was our thing. And now every year he wants to continue doing that and making it bigger so yeah <laughs> that's so cool yeah we gotta see that i get the biggest kick out of it and i show my boys and they're like come on mom now we need a dirt track in our backyard i'm like honey we're honey no i, I just got grass put in we're not we're not doing that <laughs> my, my parents-in-law they have a dried up pond and we're like listen we will bring the equipment let us hollow it out and make it into a dirt track. Like, come on, like, let's just, let us do it. 
You know, nobody's yeah. using it for anything. Go for it. Exactly. Well, we will jump into some some racing questions for yeah. you, Joey. You know, you have you're a two time champion. You have tons of wins under your belt. But is there a particular race or a track um, that you haven't won at that you would like to get that win? Yeah. Yeah, it probably stands out the most um, for multiple reasons. One, it is indie, right? Like the, yeah. the, the crown jewel event, the event that you want to click off and say, I've kissed the bricks, right? Like you, you want to, I want to make out with those bricks. On there. That's <laughs> I want to do. Yeah. Um, you, know, you can just do that, right? They have fan no, hours. It's not really, it doesn't, that doesn't count. You have to earn this one. Okay. You gotta, you gotta take, it takes a while to earn the love of the bricks. Okay. You gotta take it out on a date a few times. You gotta give it a few hours. It doesn't just happen. Okay. So, we're, we're trying harder to make that happen. And the fact that it's Roger's track, like Roger Penske owns yeah, it. Yeah. And I drive, you know, for Roger for shoot 12 years now or so, um, you know, feeling like I'm part of that family. I really want to check that box. Um, so we've come close a few times and I'm excited it's back on the oval. <laughs> I think I'm yeah. better at the oval than I am the road course there. Um, so I'm excited to give that a shot. That's what a lot of the drivers are saying this season. I'm excited it's back too. I, I'm going to miss the road course because I did really like the launching off of the curbs. Like that was just really yeah. fun for me. That was fun yeah. to watch. Fun for you. <laughs> yeah, it was fun for me. Maybe yeah. not for you. But it, was <laughs> <laughs> it was very fun for me. I enjoyed it. So you've said this before, and I think a lot of people feel this way. Haley Deegan said it when she was on our podcast. You're not at the track to make friends. You're here to compete. Why do you think it's important to approach things that way? And are there instances where you don't approach things that way? Like, do you have some buddies out there? Um, I, I try to separate it the best I can. And it's not because I don't like the drivers I, I race against. I think we all have a lot in common. And I think the majority of them are really good people. But you got to think of what is the definition of a true friend, right? A true friend is truly happy for someone else's success. And can I honestly sit here and tell you I am happy for anyone else that wins a race besides me? Nope, I can't. And so that would make me a pretty fake friend. <laughs> <laughs> I respect that. And I'm not here to be that guy, right? Like yeah. I, I don't, and I don't want to have that thought even cross my mind when I'm out there, mm -hmm. right? Like there, there's times like, oh, you know, oh, better he won than somebody else, right? Like, there's, oh, well, cool, he hasn't won in a while, good for him, I guess. But I'm still like, I'm not happy for him that much. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? And so I, that's just who I am. And, you know, I, I guess I think later on in life, when my driving career is over, the drivers I race against today will have, will have so much in common that I can see a natural friendship being being there um and and some of them like don't get me wrong i get along with 99 percent of them like we, we get along it's just that i'm not going to call them and say let's go to dinner together yeah. or let's hang out like the only driver that i really have a relationship a little bit like that with is, is brad you know, brad i was about and I to say bradley and joseph and, yeah we were, we were a team <laughs> for a long time and and he's probably the only driver i call and just bs with mm -hmm. just about life yeah. um and and it's because they're, our wives are friends, you know, the kids go, you know, they're, they're friends together. So like it, it just kind of works. Um, that's a really unique one. <laughs> I mean, your teammates I get along with and I'm with them all the time. Right. And, and, you know, there's relationships there, but it's just a, there's a weird, it's a weird thing, right? Like they're, they're out there to beat me. They're there to take food off my plate. Right. Like yeah. that's kind of what it's about for me. Like as a friend, I don't want to be that person to somebody. Um, so it's a, it's kind of an odd thing for us to, well, when to you're relate. being the honest yeah. you can be, you know, living your self truth, right. And you're a competitor. This is your livelihood. Your job is to win. So you, I, I feel like that's a very fair and honest answer for sure. I agree fully. Yeah. I mean, I mean with the old statement, right. You bring your friends with you to the racetrack, right? Like, <laughs> uh, yeah. Like you don't meet them there. You bring them with you. Yeah. No, you usually don't. Like, yeah. I, I got good time for that away from the racetrack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you started in this sport really young. So I'm so curious, too, about um, 
you know, and I even as a at track reporter now have some regrets too, as far as like the way I've teed up a question or I leave an interview thinking, oh man, I should have asked this or the way I worded that was totally wrong. Or I do live hits at the track, you know, it's live to everybody there on the PA. And there's some times <laughs> where my brain gets a little jumbled, but I was so curious too, as far as with your work, has there been anything on the track, like a move you've made or an interview where you said something, you're like, man, I probably shouldn't have said that. Or is there <laughs> any yeah. regretful moment? <laughs> like, yeah, I got you. <laughs> Let me repeat these things I regret right now. Weekly. We're all human. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? I, 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 there's so many examples. I don't think I need to get into the examples because it happens all the time. Yeah. But Me too. I, I, Maybe this is my, my weird way of looking at things sometimes, but I think the fact that you're willing to go out there and put yourself out there and take risks in your life, like that, that's risky, right? Doing live television or over PA or whatever we're doing, even doing this right now, there's risk involved, right? Like it takes some guts to do it and you may say the wrong thing, but you know, it's better than sitting on the couch watching TV doing nothing, right? Like I'd rather make 10 mistakes throughout the day and actually do something with my life than sit there and make no decisions all day long and, and make no mistakes. I'd rather right. make a hundred decisions and do something. And if that comes with looking like an idiot every now and again, I don't know. <laughs> so be it. I'll get over it. I, <laughs> okay. I, I think like this all the time. And it's very interesting to know that other people have opinions about you while you're doing these things. Like it's, it's an odd dynamic to think about. Well, you're judged on everything you do. Yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, right? I mean you, there's listeners right now that are listening to this, this podcast and they're either saying this is entertaining or not. <laughs> and guess what? It matters what they think, because if they don't like it, guess what? You guys aren't on the air anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. right? like, and it happens. So, you have to like as much as you want to say I don't care about anyone's opinion. I it is a cat walking the car. I know that's that's Portia. That that's Portia. Um, she she's our mascot. She joins. Hold on, Portia. Show show Joey your face. She's our podcast. Show mascot. Joey your face. Say uh, hi, Joey. Why cat? I know that's that's my child. Um, she There's walks. Everything I need to know about you. Okay, oh, I learned yeah. a lot. We're yeah. right now. <laughs> We're getting into go karts, Joey. Okay, I don't need your judgment. We're getting into go karts. She's going to be very successful. She's yeah, going to right. be. She's going to beat you one day. So yeah. you judge her now. All right. That's hysterical. I love it. I love <laughs> She's rubbing it. her face against the screen. That's um, okay. So speaking of regrets and calling people, since you don't usually call a lot of people except Bradley, of course, um, have you ever had to make a next day phone call with a driver after an incident? Oh, do yeah. you do, okay. How does that go? Are you just like, Hey buddy, how, do you do like a little intro, like small talk? Like it's raining. How's it going yeah. over there? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> and then get to the punchline. Um, <laughs> probably depends on who it is. <laughs> and it can go a lot of different directions and sometimes I don't call and I'll just try to find them at the racetrack and be like, Hey, you know, let's just talk. Me and you yeah. basically. Um, I'd rather do it that way. But sometimes like I'd rather just get it done and out of the way. Um, but I usually, I mean, usually there's an explanation for what happened. Right. And if it's your mistake, you say, I, I screwed up. Like you found me. <laughs> I am sorry. And you don't know where it's going to go from there, but all you can be is honest and say, I, I effed up, right? Like, yeah. now what do I do? Um, you know, and, and you kind of just roll with the punches from there. Um, sometimes they, you know, a driver, be like, I, I get it. Or, oh, I had one coming or, oh, you have one coming. Uh, <laughs> you know, okay. And like, if they say, yeah, you know, I guess I probably do. I did wreck you. you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> What are you supposed to say? Um, but I have learned over the years that saying nothing is the worst thing you can do. Um, you, you gotta, you gotta, just like any other relationship, right? With your, with your wife uh, or for your husband or boyfriend, whatever. Um, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta talk about things, right? If it's bothering you, you gotta say something, unless it turns into something even bigger than what it really right. was in the first place. Mm -hmm. So same thing. Yeah, Same thing. Yeah, communication is key for sure. Well, let's talk about Talladega. We're heading Talladega. into Talladega. You've got three wins there. And I know it's one of those races that's unpredictable. And that's the theme of our show today is unpredictable races. How are you so good there? 
I feel like it's it's such a hard racetrack. Everybody's waiting for the big one. How have you figured yeah. that place out? Um, I don't know if I've ever had it figured out. Like I, I think the draft constantly evolves. Um, the the drivers change, the teams change, the cars change. Uh, and sometimes that, that happens throughout the race itself, uh, from the beginning to the end as, you know, drivers are doing different things, right? And you look at today's super speedway racing is, you know, you got manufacturer alliance, you get teamwork going on there with, with not just the manufacturers, but also like zoomed in a little bit more with the actual teams. Um, and then you get this fuel mileage game that's been going on on these super speedways. Uh, that's, that's not a secret, but that's, you know, something that's been going on for a few years now and now it's really exposed and it's gone to the very extreme, right? Remember Daytona, we're going, <laughs> we were going so slow. It was, uh, it, was, it was like a bicycle race is what I thought. Like, was just a of times moving and a couple of people like jumped out to try to get the field yeah. going back. It was like, what are we doing? Uh, and that's just a whole different type of racing that, we haven't explored yet. So uh, it just evolves is my point. Um, and you have to continue to be a student of the sport as a driver, but also working with your spotter. Um, you know, Coleman and I have a very close relationship that I feel like we understand each other's thought process and we study the the speedways together, um, you know, to make sure that, that we know what we want to do in certain scenarios um, mm -hmm. because it's just, make or break moments that happen um mm -hmm. right like there's a there's the parts of the race where you're saving fuel and trying to position yourself for a very fast pit stop and those type of things but then there's the end of the race where what lane do we want to be in if we're in what position and what's going on and a lot of that is just over time you learn and talk about it again yeah. right and we go through those things that's to keep you know up to date with that stuff it's just it's hard Oh, I respect Coleman and all of those spotters so much because I spotted for the first time in my life at Circuit of the Americas in the Xfinity race, and they were doing the pace laps, and I was like, oh, oh, oh I'm yeah, so nervous. It is, it is oh. hard. <laughs> it's terrifying. It's easy to all over your words, for sure. <laughs> oh, it was terrifying. It was really, really scary. But, you know, we survived. We're good. So the logistics of drafting tracks is what I'm really curious about. We watch on TV, and I feel like for people who are unfamiliar with racing – Watching on TV with a drafting track, you really get a sense of how intense this is and how much is on the line. But what is going on in the car? What does the car feel like for you? What are you listening to? What are you paying attention to? What are you trusting Coleman, your spotter, for? What is going on in a single lap at Talladega? Well, your 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 senses are on overload for sure uh, because you're you're trying to take in so much data to make a decision, and that's coming from your ears. Right. So your, your spotter is telling you what's going on behind you um, when you're pushed up right up on somebody. You're, he's telling you what's going on in front of him so you don't push him through the next person and create a wreck either that way. So you're you're listening a lot um, and you're, you're visually, you know, windshield mirror, windshield mirror, windshield mirror constantly. Um, and then you're, you're, you get your feelings, right? You're feeling the car move, buffering. Uh, you know, understanding where the runs are coming from, feeling that momentum uh, that can be built up in your car at the moment. Uh, and, and you're trying to take all that data to make a quick decision, right? And, and a lot of that's also going off of memory too of this works, this move works, this is what we studied, this this is what I want to do at some point. Like you feel it coming, that intensity and before that decision is made. Um, and eventually you have to make it. Uh, whether that's to stay or not make the move, but you can imagine all of that getting thrown at you while you're driving this car at 200 mile an hour. And you're like, yeah, like it's just <laughs> a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, but that's what makes it fun, right? I mean, every driver is going through the same thing and that, that decision you make, whether it's to stay in line or to, to make the move and make the pass or whenever that is, gosh, it's like, it's do or die, right? Like yeah. it, it, it's, it's a lot. And it's not like you have time to think, right? Like you can't like phone a friend and be like, hey, what do you think I should do here? <laughs> right, yeah. What do you, you think? Which way should yeah, I go? <laughs> even with Coleman telling me everything that's going on, I can't like pause the race and say, hey, I, in this scenario, what do you think we should do? Like that's what we do when we study the race. We pause it and yeah. go, in this scenario, we should probably have done this. But in the moment, you have to do it now. Do it. So that prep is everything. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's what makes it so exciting for the fans, too, because we're like, ah, where are they going to go? What are they going to do in this moment? But you've been able to maneuver Talladega, so it's really exciting to see you out there. But I know you've got to run really quickly. I do want to talk about the Joey Logano Foundation. You've got this big event coming up in May, and I believe one of my favorite artists is performing there. Who is it? Mm -hmm. Let's. Oh, I want to hear her. Well, Do okay, I mean, so this is, our, this is our second annual charity concert, and for the Joe Legato Foundation, we, we help give uh, foster families and foster kids the tools and resources they need to, to become a contributing member of society, and, and it is unbelievable what these families do. Um, and, and Monica, you could probably relate the, the best on this because you're, you're, you're a parent, but <laughs> when you imagine like taking in a, a, a child that has gone through some of the worst possible things that a kid can ever go through, and they're looking at you as a stranger to, to help them through their life, like, and you don't even know what they've gone through, or sometimes they don't want to talk about it. Now, can you imagine like how challenging that is to be a foster parent? Like it blows my mind how hard that is. And the, the organizations we work with are so incredible uh, to, to really um, help the, help all of those, the whole scenario, every, everybody involved um, to get through that, that hard moment. And uh, the success stories that don't happen for years down the road, right? It's a long-term investment so you see the success stories of these young children, um, but they're there. And that is really cool. And we have a lot of great people supporting the foundation to do that. And part of the way we, we support these these organizations that we support is through fundraisers and the concert we did last year it was fantastic we raised a ton of money um it was a blast and we're gonna so we're gonna do it again okay and it's at coyote joe's and it is on uh thursday may 23rd and coyote joe's is in north carolina and we are our lineup this year we got tracy lawrence we got walker hayes Okay. Is, it, is Walker Hayes your person? Yeah, I love oh, Walker Hayes. Hayes. Uh, I like Walker Hayes a lot too. Um, and then we also have a group called the Frontmen, and that's Richie McDonald, uh, Larry Stewart, and Tim Rushler. They're they're from they're like uh, a group that that you know one's from Lone Star, one's from Russell's Heart, Little Texas, and, yeah. and they they kind of go up there and sing together. So it's a guitar pool. So they'll go up there and each one will sing a song and then it'll kind of keep going around uh, a few times. And so we sold this thing out last year quickly. So coyote Joe's or coyote dash Joe's.com is the, uh, the website to go to, to get your tickets. Um, but awesome. it's going to be a good time. I promise you that it's fun. It will be a good time. I'm going to try to be there. I'll be, you know, out to here, but we're going to try to go. Um, <laughs> That's going to be brave if you go there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I got I to gotta work them out, you know. Uh, there you but, go. but thank you so much for joining us, Joey. Best of luck this weekend in Talladega. We greatly appreciate you taking time to be with us here on Mike's yes. Hot. Thank you, guys. Good times. Thank you. Bye. I feel like I learned so much about Joey Logano today. Monica, you know Joey better than I do, but how do you feel? Oh, gosh, yeah. I mean, and, and he's always been very open and honest in his live interviews as well at the track. Um, but, yeah, there's tons of great insight. And to see him also, you know, in a different light for people that can't make it to the track for those live interviews. It was, it was so cool to have him on. It really was cool to have him on. And I think it's very interesting when you hear people talk about their lives and how they treat things in their lives, like how Joey talks to his kids about doing things and success and stuff like that, that really humanizes people in a way that sometimes the sport itself, any sport doesn't because if you're just watching someone on TV and they throw a basketball and they miss and you're like, oh, ah, why did you miss? But then you hear them talk about how they parent and how they grew up and what they do now and how they interact with friends. And you really start to humanize that person and like them more than just blanket watching a sport. Yeah, I totally agree. And then, you know, when you see him and his family at the track, you have a little more of a background of what they're going through you know, at home with juggling three kids and trying not to put push racing onto Hudson, you know, because I'm sure Hudson, you know, as Joey was saying, has that pressure of he's Joey Logano's son and coming to the mm -hmm. racetrack and everybody's expecting him to run well. Well, what if he wants to play basketball? And I love that Joey's like, and that's fine. If you want to do it, go for it 100%. Exactly. And like, what if he wants to just run around out there and not be number one? Like be a kid. 
I think it's, yeah, I think it's important, especially for kids, but also for everybody to just go, you don't have to be number one at everything you do. You can just try and do well at, like do as well as you can at it, but you don't have to be number one at everything you do. And you don't have to go out there and be Joey Logano's kid. You know, you can just be a kid. Yeah, I agree. I, it's so funny, too, because being out at the racetrack, I do see, as Joey was talking about, making it a relaxed experience for Hudson. He did mention that when, when they do go to race, but even just when they're there for Joey's work weekends, I've seen him driving Hudson well, and all of his kids when he can around uh, the fan zone by himself, no, no entourage, letting, his, letting Hudson go play in the kid zone or grab a drink in the concession stand, or just living a as normal of a life on the road as they can. Mm-hmm. No, I fully agree. So we're about to close out the show, but Monica, how are you feeling about Talladega? How are you feeling about the season so far? What do we think? I am ready. I'm okay. Tal- Talladega. Are you going? One of my fic- yeah, I'll be there. So I'm, you know, I'm fat and sassy right now. I'm in my third <laughs> trimester. So I'm going to be, <laughs> bumping along over there at Big Bills in the infield. But um <laughs> you could just bump into people. <laughs> yeah, we're like excuse me. Oh boop. Um, <laughs> boop. <laughs> but it is awesome. I know I've talked about this several times on here. The in the infield well, and out in the campsite too. It's just amazing. The whole fan experience is lively. It is alive. They've got bands out in the campsite. They have um entertainment in the infield. It's just and the racing is unpredictable. Like we've also been that, about. <laughs> yeah. Also the racing too. <laughs> also that. No, I think that's amazing. I'm very excited for you. Obviously, I will just watch on TV. I'll sit at home, hang out. I didn't get any spotting gigs for Talladega, sadly. <laughs> yeah, we'll work on. It. Um, we'll work on that. We'll see if anybody will trust me to do that. But that'll be really fun. I'm very happy for you. Very happy for Joey. I'm so glad we did this today. And we will be back in two more weeks with Mics Are Hot. Thank you all so much for listening. We love you. We appreciate you. And we will see you next time. Mm